Buenas noches para todos, Hamzu, Tata, Saipan, Luta, Zantinian, Guahu, Si, Carlada, De Leon, Guerrero. Good evening and welcome to the Wednesday edition of KMCV News. I'm Glenn Wakai. We'll have weather and sports in just a few minutes. But first, let's turn to the top of our cast this evening. The search continues for a missing fisherman. Three men went out spearfishing near Managaha and only two returned to shore. The missing Palawan man was reported lost at sea by his two companions yesterday afternoon. DPS officials immediately began a search, which was called off at nightfall. Pamela Picardal reports on today's developments. The public boating safety officials have been scouring the Tanabag and Manyagal waters since yesterday afternoon, searching for any trace that could lead to the whereabouts of the missing Palawan man. Assistant Police Chief Rabi Camacho identified a missing victim as 25-year-old Melvin Ingerpli. Camacho reports that Ingerpli went spearfishing with two other companions, identified as James Omar and Kukut Rubiangi, around 11 o'clock yesterday morning down in the Tanapag Reef area. Omar reports he was in the fishing boat and Rubiangi was guiding the M-boat or floating device to catch fish while Ingerpli was snorkeling and trying to catch some fish. Omar disclosed his back was fronting them and at about 3 p.m. he turned around and saw that Ingerpli was not on sight. Omar says he and Rubiangi scarred the waters for the lost man. However, he says they failed to see any signs and so they called for help. The DPS rescue team who started conducting the search operations since yesterday have been moving to and from the seaplane ramp in lower base and going back and forth towards the Maniaga and Tanapag borders, still showing no signs of Ingerp Plei. Yeah, we started ever since yesterday and this morning. But nothing? Nothing, even last night. So you feel uh, they believe that the current yeah. swept him there, yeah. Maniaga? Yeah. Even out, outside the reef, who knows? Nobody knows. So you're still praying that he's still alive? Or Hopefully. at least you can find something. Find him. Find at least a sign. Parts of his fishing gear. So. But the aerial and water search will continue, according to we Police are Chief Antonio Rages. So we'll be doing this, uh, we will see the outcome of today. And normally, our procedure is uh, we will search regardless whether we have uh, anything come out regarding like we locate you know some part of uh, like the fins or so forth but we will do so by uh, we were still going out tomorrow the missing person's relatives were also there anticipating that the next moment could be good news for them in Kirkley's cousin Mary Lou told KMCV News they've stayed up all night since yesterday hoping that a miracle could happen at any given time. Chief Rages says this is the second missing person reported this year. In Gerpley's family hope that the DPS and Civil Defense Rescue Team will be successful in their endeavor to find in Gerpley. In Lower Base, I'm Pamela Bigardal for KMCV News. Inger Pli reportedly has a wife and a five-month-old child. This is the second ocean-related missing person this year. In January, it's believed that Renato Jimena fell off the Aginga and cliff line while crab hunting. And the zoning plan is still up in the air despite a nearing deadline. The hearing between the Saipan delegation and the zoning board was to continue this afternoon after recessing last night. But because not enough members from the delegation attended, the meeting was postponed. Representative Herman Palacios had hoped that they would vote on the zoning plan today. He says he's ready to vote no for the many constituents who have asked him to. The, uh, the major issue when you, when you talk to people that are older especially, you know, they, they come up and they always say this, you know, no one should have any business coming into my land to tell me either how to use my land or what not to do on my land. Representative Palacio says he is also voting no to preserve the way of the island. He feels that if the zoning plan goes through, Saipan will never be the same. If, if Saipan was any bigger than what it is, you know, where we can put aside this place for this particular uh, purpose, that place for that particular purpose, why not? But it's such a small island, and uh, the, the tradition and custom is that don't come into my property and tell me how to use it. What? 
Representative Stanley Torres also came out today opposing the zoning plan. He states it would, be, it would hinder a family's ability to build additional houses on the same lot for its children, a local custom known as Partida. Ten or more votes are needed to pass or kill the zoning plan. If neither action is done soon, the proposal will automatically become law. And officials from the Mariana Housing Islands Housing Authority are asking the Senate to consider appropriating funds to their agency. This morning at, public at a public hearing on Capitol Hill, MIHA Director John Sablon asked for $800,000 to go towards operating costs. He says MIHA has not been allocated any money since 1989, and it was becoming increasingly difficult to keep the agency afloat. But because of smaller revenues and a concerted effort on belt tightening at the government level, Senator Jesus Sablan, chairman of the Senate Ways and Means Committee, says accommodating MIHA's request may not be possible. I don't think uh, we can uh, do much in a given time. We just have to think tank another way of raising revenue. If uh, Mr. Ilo Inos uh, finance will be gracious enough to identify uh, fresh new revenues, Perhaps we could be of some help. Despite budget cutbacks, the MIHA director hopes the Senate can show its commitment to the cinemized housing needs by fulfilling their financial requests. The federal government is also feeling a budget pinch. President Bill Clinton's goal of deficit reduction can be seen in the Office of Territorial and International Affairs budget proposal. The fiscal 94 request of $320 million represents a decrease of nearly $34 million from this year's budget. OTIA Acting Assistant Secretary Ruth Van Cleves says this year's smaller request is attributed to the completion of projects and compliance with terms of negotiated agreements. One of those negotiated agreements is the new 702 funding agreement with the CNMI, a decrease of almost $6 million from last year. Local leaders will be going to Washington, D.C. on May 4th to justify the $22 million that they want next year. KMCV News will be in the nation's capital to cover the entire budget hearing. And there's a rumor circulating around the U.S. Congress which looks favorably upon the Senate's new version of the minimum wage bill. That's according to Tinian Senator David Singh. He and Senate President Juan Demopan transmitted a copy of their minimum wage proposal last week to Congressman Louis Payne and George Miller to get their feedback. Senator Singh says although he hasn't formally received any comments, he's heard the bill looks good. I've heard through a revise, uh, representative of the task force went to uh, Washington and met with uh, uh, Miller and uh, Payne, their staff, and uh, I think they, they like this. They, they want us to start with uh, this one. Senator Singh expects to formally introduce that bill to the Senate at the next session. It proposes to raise the local minimum wage to federal standards according to how the economy fares in the next few years. The House version would bring the local minimum wage to federal standards over seven years. And when we come back, we'll tell you about a handful of students at the high school who were busted for smoking marijuana. And the Contractors Association talks about the effects of Article 12 on their industry. What was once the CNMI's biggest industry is quickly fading. Just three years ago, construction was pulling in about $2 billion a year. But building pro by building projects, contractors were building the local economy. But now they're fighting for survival. Many attribute the decline to a controversial decision, decision two years ago. Today, a local attorney spoke before the CNMI Contractors Association about the problems surrounding Article 12. It was a buyer's market in the 1970s and 80s. Land was selling for $1 to $10 per square meter. Attorney Larry King says back then you could legally buy a nice parcel of land for about $40,000. Several people then turned around five years later and leased that land out for as much as $400,000 or maybe $4 million. King says in some cases the value of land skyrocketed by as much as 2,000%. Many local persons uh, think that they got cheated uh, out of their land, even though at the time uh, they, they sold their land for what was a fair price at, at the time. Many landowners then turned to Article 12 to soothe their displeasure. Now about 15 land alienation cases are pending before the CNMI court. A few weeks ago, a superior court decision in favor of the Wobbles has sent chills through the private sector. The recent uh, 
sparrings with, between Ted Mitchell and, and Ben Salas did not change any law. All it has done is opened up investors' eyes to uh, the real possibility of actually getting kicked off of their property. Real estate agent Sam Rayburn has assisted in getting leases for many foreign investors, but he can no longer do so in confidence. The air of uncertainty is too great. I think it would be really a shame if, uh, as Japan's economy turns around, we're not prepared and outside investment ends up in Guam or other more secure environments. There are currently four bills before the legislature intended to provide a secure environment for leasing land in the CNMI. The Contractors Association recommends the passage of all of them. And something else the industry is concerned with are two bills introduced by U.S. Representative Elton Gallegli. One, of the, one would terminate 702 funding and the second would impose federal immigration regulations here. Tomorrow we'll hear how contract, why contractors say the bills would devastate the already languishing industry. Japanese interest in the Northern Marianas date back to the turn of the century. The Japanese have looked at the NMI as a valuable resource. Through wars and economic shifts, Japanese businessmen have been a constant catalyst to growth here. And that commitment to the island was reinforced once again today with the start of a $40 million project. Here's that story. Today's groundbreaking ceremony for the first phase of a $40 million golf course on leased government land was an eye-opener for a lot of folks who remembered the good old days. The side of island leaders rubbing elbows with Japanese investors and developers used to be a pretty common sight around the island. Groundbreaking ceremonies for major development projects were also a pretty common occurrence. But given the downturn in Japan's economy and the uneasiness over Article 12 disputes here, the number of Japanese-backed projects have dwindled. Governor Lorenzo de Leon Guerrero told the gathering today that the Shimizu Corporation's faith in the island's economy will inspire confidence in others. And I know from experience that economic setbacks are temporary. And the most important economic indicator of all is the confidence of the consumer and the investor. Because of your confidence and that other companies I believe we are at the beginning of an economic upswing of our commonwealth. Speaker Tomas Vizigomez also expressed thanks to the Shimizu Corporation for sticking with the project through thick and thin. We are most grateful for your sense of commitment and courage given the current set of circumstances. Let us work together for a better Northern Marianas community. Itsuo Okuyama is the president of SC Properties, the subsidiary of Shimizu Corporation tasked with developing the Kagman course. He says the project will not impact the island's utility systems. This uh, developing area is a little far from the infrastructure of the Mariana Island. So uh, first we try to make it ourselves to our generators and uh, water also, we make it ourselves, and the sewage control, we make it, and that means, uh, you know, self-management. Project consultant Pete A. Tenorio says islanders don't have to worry that the island's water supply will get contaminated. The uh, use of uh, pesticides, uh, herbicides, and fertilizers will be minimized. Uh, another thing is that the groundwater here is, is not within the public uh, groundwater system. It's further up that you have the uh, groundwater, you know, the well stopping the groundwater. So this is an isolated uh, groundwater area. Tenorio says the project should be completed within the next two years. And a man entered into a plea agreement today. Assistant Attorney General Stephen Pixley says Efren Rages pled guilty to two counts of aiding and abetting and assault with a dangerous weapon. Pixley says Efren Rages could have gotten 20 years in jail, but he agreed to cooperate. Rages will testify as a state witness against two other suspects, Joseph Anthony Boy and his brother Mario Rages. And in other police news, seven Marianas High School students were apprehended yesterday for illegal use of marijuana. Two campus security guards told police they noticed that the minors were smoking and passing around what looked to be a marijuana cigarette. Assistant Police Chief Ray B. Camacho says the incident took place in a boonie area on the east side of the campus. Camacho disclosed that the juveniles were apprehended, booked, and taken in for questioning. The Federal District Court will soon render a decision on whether or not sanctions will be lodged against the attorneys for the Wiseman and Eason law firms. 
court records show that on April, in April of 91, David Wiseman, who initially represented about a dozen Thai workers, filed a lawsuit against Onwell Garment Factory. The workers' claims include unpaid wages, overtime sleep wages for forcing them to have a curfew, and substandard food and housing be benefits. And that lawsuit reportedly went on to a jury trial in June of 92. The jury reportedly found that the workers were not telling the truth and that their claims had no valid foundation. The attorneys for Onwell then moved to allege that David Wiseman's firm conducted no discovery or had never taken any depositions or asked Onwell for payroll records. The Onwell lawyers claimed that Onwell management spent over $230,000 in court expenses and attorney fees. The Onwell attorneys moved that Wiseman's law firm and its plaintiffs should pay for the incurred expenses. Wiseman's attorney Rex Cossack argued in court yesterday that Wiseman did a fairly good job and adds that the workers have justifiable claims. However, Onwell's attorney Bruce Jorgensen contends that such claims were invalid from the start and the labor case should never have been filed in the first place. U.S. District Court Judge Alex Munson ruled that Onwell's motion will be taken under advisement. All attorneys involved in this case say it's not appropriate to make any comment at this time since the federal court has not rendered its decision. And now we move to a different court. The new basketball and tennis courts in San Vicente have a new name. This morning, the governor signed into law a bill that designates these recreational areas as Commissioner Joaquin S. Tadella Courts. Commissioner Tadella's family was on hand to witness this event. The commissioner's granddaughter, Paz Jonas, says she's very proud. Oh, I just feel so happy and really grateful for the recognition being given to my grandfather because he is the founder of the uh, Sabicenti uh, village. He's the first commissioner and then uh, I think for, he, he was for two, three terms and then he was ready to give to other people you know, to, uh, to lead the village. The governor today also signed a proclamation declaring the week of May 9th as Historic Preservation Week. And joining me on the set now is Longshot Willie. Willie, you think you're going to be taking advantage of the new Tadella courts? Uh, well, I just played that once against the PIC for that sports challenge. A and memorable that, challenge. That did it. That was enough. <laughs> Tonight will feature Bob's. Tonight's feature in Bob's Baseball Bites is the Blue Sharks. And Boris Becker is back. And he moves on to the second round of the Nice Open. Saipan Phil American Lions Club will have its second annual no tap bowling tournament at the Saipan Bowling Center on April 17th, 18th, and 25th. Parts of its proceeds will be donated to the Manamku or senior citizens. The champion will receive $1,500. There will also be a raffle with the grand prize being a round trip ticket to Manila. For more information, contact Jess Rubusada at 234-5441. In other local sports, this Friday is the last day for next month's second annual Goodwill Golf Tournament which is being sponsored by the Marianas Visitors Bureau and the Marianas Country Club as one of the activities for CNMI Tourism Week. Registration forms are available at the MVB office for $60 per player, which covers green and card fees. The tournament will take place on May 7th at the Marianas Country Club. You can buy up to two mulligans for $5 each, and for an extra $5, you can enter other contests, which are closest to the pin on par three holes, longest drive on the 13th hole, and the lowest number of putts per round. All proceeds go to Tourism Scholarship Fund administered by MVB. It's the fourth inning for base Bob's Baseball Bites. Bob Codine is featuring a profile on each team of the Saipan Major League. Tonight's feature is on the Blue Sharks. Hello, baseball fans. Tonight we'll look at the Blue Sharks, sponsored by Bud Light. They are managed by Ippolito Ogden and coached by Tom Nguyen. The Sharks are a much different team than the one that swam to the championship series last year. They lost many of their veteran players and will depend on lots of rookies this year. Their pitching staff is led by crafty southpaw Nixon Arurang. C.O. Nguyen is a side-arming junk baller who throws from the right side. 
Darwin Nirmadal is a good-looking rookie catcher for the Sharks. The first baseman is Joe Johannes. Ryang Yosino can also play there along with Wills Takeo. Narus Edip, who hit 357 last year, plays a solid second base. The shortstop is the quick Junior Martin. He batted 267 last year and runs the bases very well. Leo Bobai is a rookie third baseman. Now the Blue Sharks have more speed in the outfield. Rookie Ray Saka roams left field. Mabel Ngrengmalas covers center. And Johnson Siprit mans right field. They also have Eddie Saka. The bench includes premium speedster Clinton Nerekhead. He won three gold medals in track at the 1990 Micronesian Games. Marky Malalem provides extra punch at the plate. The Blue Sharks are comprised of many of the players who won the slow pitch softball title last year. This year it'll be a learning experience for them, but don't count them out. Hey, this is Bob Coldine with Baseball Bites. Welcome back, and we look forward to welcoming Vicky Tadella back soon. Let's jump right into tonight's forecast. The seas tonight will be slight to moderate at 3 to 5 feet. The surf will be 4 to 6 feet on northern through southeastern beaches and reefs. And we'll have a low tide of 0.2, 2 tenths of a foot at 819 tonight, and a high tide of 2.2 feet just before 3 o'clock tomorrow morning. Tonight we will have partly cloudy skies, and tomorrow mostly sunny skies are in the forecast. And that's it for weather. We are out of time, Carlotta, but before we go, we'd like to say to all our viewers to stay tuned to this channel for the John Anderson Show, where we're going to have a very special <laughs> sneak guest, guest, sneak, guest host <laughs> sneaking out of the set. And that guest host will be discussing the garment industry with Robert O'Connor. On behalf of the entire KMCV News team, thanks for joining us tonight. Good night. Good night. Good night.